Hi, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. And to our overseas visitor, visitors, good evening. I'd like to start off by just talking a little bit about the program today. I'll give some brief opening comments, a little bit of an update about the port and some of the other activities here in Los Angeles. Uh, if you have a question, there's the capability on Zoom to raise your hand, or you can type into the chat box what that question or comment may be. Also looking for advice. Anybody who has some ideas on how we can do things a little better here in the United States, it would be welcome. So to start off, uh, the Port of Los Angeles remains open. All of our terminals are in operation. And once a, uh, once a week, maybe twice a week, we put up drones in the air through Port Police Chief and Head of Public Safety, Tom Gazy, to make sure our 7,500 acres of property and 43 miles of waterway are safe and secure. And as a residual effect, we get to take a look at our terminal operations, ship, the connectors, rail, and truck. Uh, you're looking right now at West Basin Container Terminal, and due to some shifting of vessel strings, you'll notice that this facility is uh, quite light in cargo. Uh, we'll continue to be working on that area. But all of our terminals, the Los Angeles Marine Terminal operators in particular, have been working around the clock and doing just great work to make sure that this port remains fluid so we can highlight and isolate those critical goods that need to move, as well as the rest of our commodities that are so important here at the Port of Los Angeles and to our customers. We're moving cargo at about 85% of normal volume at this time of year, 85% or we're down 15%. It's also about 60% of the peak that we witnessed last October during the height of the US-China trade war. So there is plenty of space, plenty of capability as we help our country reemerge from the economic shutdown that we've witnessed for the past uh, seven to eight weeks based on emergency orders at the federal, state, and local levels. So beginning today, we'll give you a, a look at the numbers. We've got nine container vessels in port, a tanker, a bulk ship, and of course the United States Navy ship Mercy. And as mentioned, all terminals are open. We also have a number of tankers that are at anchor, and some of you have seen that even on the national news. These folks are at anchor outside the port of Long Beach, and at the bottom of this screen, you'll see that about 12 of those vessels are due into the port of Long Beach. Uh, a number are going up to El Segundo specifically for Chevron. Others are awaiting instructions, and simply because all of our storage facilities are very full, as you can imagine. Most of us are not driving as much as we normally do. With the absence of a storm that came through early last week, moderate temperatures throughout the country for heating oil, and our takeoffs and landings at uh, LAX Airport here in uh, Southern California are only about 5% of normal. So the jet fuel that we normally send up to the uh, airport area is not taking place as well. So that's why you'll see some of these anchorage uh, uh, looks from, uh, from the air. Also, the vessels that are out there at anchor represent less than half of the anchorage slots that are available. And this port complex was designed with just that in mind to protect inside the breakwater as well as make sure that our ships had necessary and safe storage in the event that we had an episode like we're witnessing today. In addition, the United States Coast Guard and their, uh, their joint work with the Los Angeles Port Police, Long Beach Harbor Patrol, Los Angeles County Sheriff, Los Angeles Police Department and Fire Department are maintaining normal patrols over these anchored ships for the safety and security of our crews, the assets, and the, uh, the cargo aboard. Looking down line a little bit, I think we talked earlier last week about our uh, volume throughput here at the Port of Los Angeles. In the month of April, we were down about 6.5%, so a little bit better than we had anticipated. For the first four months, we're down about 15%, as mentioned, on the container side. And for the coming months of May and June, we'll see a precipitous drop in cargo volume. There are about 28 to 30 blank sailings that have been announced at this point in time that'll carry us through the second quarter. Uh, many of you know your firms 
are delaying, postponing, or even canceling some orders in the retail community. And we're starting through the port optimizer and the booking system that we've enabled to see that from the shipping line side. So we'll be watching this very closely. The, uh, the voided sailings represent right now about 25 to 26% of the normal sailings that would be calling Los Angeles at this time of year. So it's a substantial number of canceled sailings at this point, and it's simply based on the lack of demand across the board. In our other lines of business, all are down with the exception of the automotive market, mainly on the heels of new customer acquisition that Mike DiBernardo, Eric Harris, and others have been working on so diligently in 2019. That came to fruition in the early part of this year. But overall, it's been estimated that American auto sales will be down this year. Uh, in 2019, new auto sales were about 17 million units. This year, it's estimated to be in the neighborhood of 14, uh, predicated on the early industry experts uh, forecasting. Okay. And a look at labor statistics, also uh, at, a, at a good physical distance is Aveen Sharma. Aveen, as some of you know, is our Director of Labor Relations and Workforce Development. He's our direct liaison to all the uh, or organized labor unions here in and around the port. And basically, the labor work is following, if not outstripping, the loss of cargo. So year to date, we're about 18, 19% down on work shifts by the ILWU here at the port. And year uh, over our three year run rate, we're down about 22%. So the amount of folks that are going out on the job in the longshore business, uh, down about 18, 19% year over year and 22% compared to our three year run rate. Uh, this is extremely impactful to our harbor community, as you know, uh, for, um, the way we, our outlook is and what we've witnessed thus far in 2020, uh, less cargo means fewer jobs. And whether it's our longshore groups, truck drivers, or others who rely on this port for work, please remember, one in nine jobs in Southern California, more than a million people in normal times go to work every day with jobs related to this port. So that is another drag on the economy that we see. But we're also very sensitive. With 33 million Americans out of work today, we're keeping this port open, and many still have jobs today because of the business that you afford us every day. And we are greatly appreciative for that. We're also looking very closely at the health statistics and monitoring this on a daily basis. A look at the diagnoses, the unfortunate mortality rate that we mourn every lost soul here in this nation, state, county, and city. As you know, our mayor has been out in front of this work every day with his 515 Pacific update to the nation, state, county, and city. We're looking very closely at the number of hospital beds that are available in the county as well as the ICU beds and the number of ventilators. Early on in our COVID-19 response, we were focused specifically on these ventilators, both intrusive and non-intrusive, because of the projected illnesses that were coming out of the expert modeling. Fortunately, we have not yet reached that peak that some observers had called for, and we look to be in very good order on the ventilating machines that are available to us here in the county. And that leads us to the other part of the update today, and it'll talk a little bit about these two shocks that we've received to the supply chain system that have impacted us here in Los Angeles and throughout the nation. Both the ill-advised trade policy out of Washington and the COVID-19 pandemic that we witnessed today has really impacted the cargo flow through the nation's largest port. You may remember in the fourth quarter of 2019 that the cargo here at Los Angeles dropped by more than 16% after we had front loaded so much import inventory and we had witnessed 14 consecutive months of export declines. The resultant effect of this policy out of Washington has been an increase in imports, a decline in exports, and a widening of the trade gap. I don't think there's any other way to measure the results of this policy. With respect to COVID-19, as I mentioned, down about 15% year to date, and some more fall off expected in both May and June. We're also behind on exports for one main reason. The phase one trade deal with China has not panned out as expected. 
Now, obviously, China's economy was hurt terribly in the first quarter of this year as they tried to curb and eradicate the virus on their own shores. But also we have not seen the agriculture community as well as heavy machinery and other services up to the level that were anticipated by those who brokered this deal in Washington. There's much more work to do in this area. And there is increased rhetoric over the past several days about what this relationship may look like in the future. The Port of Los Angeles' portfolio includes about 55% of our business to and from China as a backdrop to these, again, increasingly nervous discussions out of Washington. As of right now, between these two specific areas of the trade policy and COVID-19 response, we see the knock-on effects of this lasting for the remainder of this year and into 2021. Uh, we'll be watching very closely with you on the order cycle process and what demand looks like. I don't think it's a discussion of an open or closed economy in the United States. As we talk about reopening, it's a re-emergence of our economy at the national state and local level throughout our land. And it will remain to be seen how impactful this slow opening is gonna be on our international supply chain. I know that John Gold has given some forward guidance as have other experts in our retail industry. We'll continue to work closely. The second piece to this update, as some of you know, Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti also asked me to concurrently hold the role of Chief Logistics Officer for the City of Los Angeles, in addition to my work as Port Director. This is in response to COVID-19 and how best we can get critical supplies to those who need them, including our hospitals and frontline medical workers. So we've assembled a team here in Los Angeles of about 20 volunteers, including people that you know, like David Levitik, Erica Calhoun, and Avine Sharma, who have been working with me around the clock to identify this market, understand the products, and how best we can get them to our frontline medical workers. The mayor had an ambition and using this great port of Los Angeles and our LAX airport to find ways that we could speed these products to market. In addition to our great domestic transportation network here in the Southland and throughout the country. We also thought that we had, with the city of Los Angeles and its procurement power, the ability to go out and buy product on our own, but without stepping on the hospitals and their normal procurement pathways. And we've done just that. We created an agreement with the Honeywell Corporation to produce and sell to us 24 million of the N95 masks that are NIOSH certified. This deal is important on three levels. One, proximity. While others were looking to overseas markets and the unfortunate gamesmanship that has taken place during COVID-19, we were able to secure a partnership with Honeywell to produce these masks six hours down the 10 freeway in Phoenix, Arizona. Very close to our Los Angeles hospital market and the ability to get the product here quickly. Second is affordability. While some of these opportunists were selling masks for five and six dollars in the gray market, we were able to produce an agreement with Honeywell for 79 cents per mask plus applicable sales tax. That exact cost will be passed on to the hospitals. There will be no margin, no overhead recouping of, of efforts here at the Harbor Department. This is all volunteer work that's being done by these great city employees. And thirdly is certainty. We have a 24 month schedule of production for these masks beginning with the first delivery of 100,000 units no later than May 31st. And we'll ramp up production in Phoenix through November where we'll peak at 1.2 million masks per month through the conclusion of that 24 month contract. We're also looking in other areas for things like isolation gowns, the level two variety the caps and footies that you'll see nurses and doctors wearing at the hospitals, IV drip apparatus, those nitrile exam gloves, and so many other products. And what we did with the great help of the former General Electric Transportation Group that is now called Wabtech, Westinghouse Air Brake Technology Company, is we bolted on to the famous port optimizer, a new medical optimizer. So having the rights to the only port community system in the nation today is also the platform that we launched for a purchase order management system, warehouse management system, and one that will track and help us expedite the product that is in motion both internationally 
and domestically. There's much more work to do here, but we are creating right now a Los Angeles stockpile of these highly sought after personal protective equipment supplies. The federal system is non-existent and unfortunately in the nation state of California with a 40 million person population, we're just oversubscribed. We could not wait any longer and we have decided to do this on our own. And again, with the great volunteerism spirit that we've shown here in Los Angeles, we'll continue to bring in goods that we can speed right out to our frontline hospitals. And that's our update for today. I know it's a lot of information, but I'm more interested in hearing your questions, commentary, or what advice you can offer us on how we can do better here in this marketplace. So Mike, I'll, Mike DiBernardo, I'll turn it over to you to see if we have any questions on the chat box or anyone has raised their hand to uh, uh, enter into the conversation here this morning and this afternoon. I have not seen anybody add anything to the chat box. Uh, if anybody has a question, please raise your hand. Uh, we're happy to address it. Jess, uh, anything from your side? Uh, any questions that you may have, Jess? Uh, no, one, just to thank you guys for uh, putting this together. I know um, with our, our colleagues on the phone and a lot of interest uh, from many of the BCOs who are major users of the port. Um, maybe you could share a little bit of kind of your outlook going forward for kind of the balance of 2020, what you're seeing and, and expecting and planning for both on the kind of ocean side and incoming, as well as the operations uh, in your in your backyard. Okay, thanks, Jess. Uh, we were on a call with the uh, International Association of Ports and Harbors, IHS Market, and JOC this morning that had about 1,200 participants. Our Eric Karras helped arrange this with the leadership at IAPH. Jan Hoffman, who is uh, one of our industry experts that works at the UN in Geneva, has a downline forecast that estimates a drop in cargo volume of 25 to 27% overall worldwide. Uh, through the COVID-19 pan pandemic. Uh, again, here in Los Angeles, we're a little more heavily weighted on the China business. So as we see right now, our drop is a little bit deeper than overall Trans-Pacific trade, both on inbound and outbound at this juncture. Uh, the lack of traction on the phase one trade agreement for exports here with China is also impacting us. Uh, it's very difficult, Jess, right now to prognosticate the balance of this year, but I think if we were to come in with a volume decline of about 20%, uh, that's probably where our focus is right now. And so you know, please, we are taking action here in the city and Harbor Department of Los Angeles as we go through our fiscal year budget ending on June 30th, 2021, we have taken some very drastic steps, starting with myself. I have given back 10% of my salary to the city in an effort to help balance our budget to an extent. We want to remain cash flow positive in 21. I think that's going to be a very difficult proposition. We also have looked at our capital investment plan and why we will maintain the integrity of every contract we hold and all of the regulatory requirements we face. We are going to look deeper at our bricks and mortar plans when it comes to discretionary projects. We want to make sure what we're doing is necessary. We want to invest through cycle as best we can, but we'll be looking at this very closely. Every division leader has been asked to cut from their discretionary budgets between five and 10%, and that may even go a little deeper as we get to our final iteration before sharing our recommended budget with the Harbor Commission and then Los Angeles City Council. We have a strict hiring freeze and a managed person personnel disposition as we go forward as well. We're not automatically backfilling jobs. If folks are going to leave us for whatever reason, those jobs will be evaluated and we'll try to do more with less. So these cuts are across the board from personnel to project planning to discretionary spend across the board. We will also be introducing a furlough concept for our employees throughout the city, with the exception of our sworn police, fire, and emergency management personnel. That furlough will be at 10% of the entire city's 45,000 employee base. There's much more to do in this area, but we're going to try to cobble back every nickel we can of discretionary spend to make sure that we're focused on the core business here at the Port of Los Angeles. And while, again, 33 million Americans are out of work today, these great government employees are going to work every day, whether they're telecommuting or this core leadership team of 10 to 15 people is coming to the office every day to work with me 
on site. Gene, we have a question from John Gold. I think, John, you'd like to ask a question? Hey, guys. Hey, Gene. Thanks for doing the, the call today. Um, wanted to ask about, you know, there's a lot prior to COVID happening and, and all the efforts that are going on. We spent a lot of time talking about the, you know, the Clean Air Action Plan and what CARB was doing. What's the status on all of that? Is that kind of put on hold now as we kind of get through this whole process? And I think we would certainly encourage that a lot of that slows down because a lot of companies right now are focusing on their survival and, you know, don't have time to focus on new regulations and requirements that's going to put other strain and stress on companies going forwards when, you know, a lot of those key folks are actually furloughed right now and don't have the opportunity to spend time mm -hmm. on that. So, you know, hopefully that is being taken into consideration by uh, the elected officials in California. So they fully understand that while we're with you guys and want to, you know, move forwards on cleaner and things like that. Uh, some of these rulings and regulations need to be slowed down until we can kind of get through this whole crisis. All right. Uh, thanks for the uh, comment, John. And, and for the members' uh, own knowledge, John has been a very close partner here with the Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach, for that matter, uh, on these areas. We're in constant communication, and John is always kind enough to offer his advice and, and the membership's guidance on your behalf, and we appreciate that. John, I can attest to you that the air has never been cleaner at the Port of Los Angeles. With folks staying at home, not as many cars and trucks on the road and cargo volume down about 15%, that is the current resultant effect. We have taken this opportunity, while I'm not sitting in rush hour traffic on our freeways, not in airports and flying all around the world like we normally do, to really focus on these video meetings. And with the help of David Libatique, Jen Cohen, and others, we have been talking to CARB board members, as uh, California Air Resources board members, as well as the South Coast Air Quality Quality Management District Board members. These single issue agencies still have work to do and we respect that, but they are also in general keenly aware of what we face here as a nation and as a global society. The first indication of that is that the California Air Resources Board has postponed rulemaking on the at-birth regulations for container ships, as well as other types of vessels that call here at California ports. They received more than 80 letters of correspondence asking for some sort of relief until we could be, get back to the business of talking with this agency in great detail. As you just said, John, most of us are focused on survival, both human and business at this point in time. And it would be unfair not to have the right voices at the table, either virtually or in person and focus solely on this issue. And I think the CARB board heard you, as did staff. And that was very important for all of us. There is much more work to do. We have the willingness to keep really pushing the envelope to be the cleanest state of ports in the nation and the world for that matter. And we'll continue down that path. In the discussions with these board members of both air regulatory agencies, they are also keenly aware that we cannot predict the future of the economy. We think that the reemergence of the American economy is going to be very slow. And to some of the financial observers in the media over the past several days, you've seen them call the recovery swoosh-like. I'm not sure our friends at Nike really appreciate that, but it'll look more like a hockey stick. There are some that believe it may be a W-shaped economy, which is equally as concerning to many of us to see some false blips, recovery, and then downturns again. So we're all watching this very closely. We're paying particular attention to the US consumer and the retail market to see how, as we slowly reemerge, what our consumer buying patterns are going to be and how quickly companies can recover, if at all in some cases. Some of your members in fast fashion have been uh, very much in the public spotlight, not only for their lack of sales, but their financial travails as well. So we too have tried to share with these two independent boards exactly what's taking place in the market and how we don't wanna predispose bad policy in uncertain economic times before we really have an understanding of where we're going as a nation. So we're trying to carry that voice, but anything you all can do as leaders or members to amplify that message would be greatly appreciative, and we'll call on you to do just that. So uh, Matt uh, Priest, I'm not sure if you're on the call, but if you have any questions from your organization, that would be great as well. Um, Hate to put people on the spot, but uh, is uh, PMSA, anybody from the PMSA would like to comment or uh, ask a question to Gene? Okay, hearing none, uh, 
hearing none. I have none on the chat either. So chats can be sent directly to Mike DiBernardo if you like, and I can read them out to Gene. But at this point, uh, I see no, uh, no questions coming through on the chat line and nobody raising their hand. So, um, okay, some other interesting uh, pieces on Logistics Victory Los Angeles. That's the name of this COVID-19 response. Uh, we've got the website up and running, which looks like a marketplace of sorts now, where we'll be showing our stockpile of inventory here in Los Angeles. So hospitals can show us their demand signals electronically, and vetted suppliers will also be able to show their inventories for matchmaking purposes. I will tell you that that has been an arduous task. We've received more than 800 leads to date over the past five weeks or so, and we've vetted through all of these in the hopes that we find good folks that want to do business and have a like-minded spirit. We found about 20 firms that qualify for consideration from the city's procurement process. So we continue to sift through all these leads. We believe that direct to manufacturer relationships, direct to company relationships are gonna give us the best chance to assist. And it's for those home improvement stores, the retailers. I must call out Target Stores, who has been just super in trying to activate some ideas with known vendors and strategic partners who have worked with us on sanitization, uh, gear and equipment, as well as solutions. Those folks, and there are so many others that have chipped in with advice and guidance, helping us connect with qualified companies. Um, the folks who will continue to do that, uh, we understand all the pressures on folks who are in this part of the business, but we cannot thank you enough for at least reaching out and giving us some guidance on how best we can, uh, we can be directed as a group of volunteers here in Los Angeles. So this has been fantastic to help with that. And I think the other piece that must be underscored is that once again, I am calling for a national port community system. I have had great discussions with the Federal Maritime Commission, the United States Coast Guard, and it is time. As we help our country reemerge economically, it would be great to have one system that will tell us where all these containers are at, how quickly we can get them to where our farmers or manufacturers need, how, how fast we can spin import containers to get to the export community. And we can only do that with one national system. It's not a matter of who the service provider will be or the underlying technician. We need to set national standards and we need to have this out there for you, the members, to be able to access. Our agricultural co-ops, big companies, family-run farms are hurting terribly right now. And no level of subsidy coming off the tariffs that you are paying is going to help the American farmer. The same with our manufacturers. Here in California, we've been working very closely with the California Manufacturing and Technology Association. These folks are looking at their membership to see who can convert factory facilities over into the PPE network. We've got folks like Wet Design right here in uh, North Los Angeles who have gone from designing fountains like at the Bellagio and the Burj Khalifa in Dubai over to making face shields for our frontline medical workers. And there are a number of great stories like that to show how nimble our factory setting can be to turn over production to help out what's needed and keep their factory workers employed. So if you have ideas out there in the retail community, if you have ideas that can help us with our hospitals, with our critical workforce, that will also be important to us and how we can partner during these difficult times to keep as many American workers on the job and doing what's necessary to help out our frontline medical people. Um, I understand that John Gold has another question and to be followed by Jess as well. Hey, Gene, thanks. Just, just wanted to follow up on, on I think, two points you, that you were just talking about. One on the, the sanitization efforts. Um, you know, I had heard from some ILW folks uh, a few weeks ago that they were concerned about lack of um, cleaning supplies and PPE and things like that. And was curious kind of the state of uh, the ability to get those kinds of products. I know, you know, even my members are concerned about their ability to get as they're focusing on store openings and you know, the ability to keep stores clean and, you know, customers and, and employees protected. So curious about, about that. And I guess a second question, um, you know, I know that we talk about the FMC, you know, Rebecca Dye has her new, uh, the fact finding 29 and new innovation teams. I know they're keeping kind of close to the vest on what they're doing. I'm just curious if I'm assuming you guys are participating in that. And if you can 
maybe talk a little bit about what's happening as part of that effort. Sure. Um, this is one of the great American stories, and that is probably about seven weeks ago, or predating Logistics Victory Los Angeles and the Mayor's Initiative. Our own Avin Sharma was in contact with uh, locals uh, 1363 and 94 here in Southern California, who made the statement that they did not have enough cleaning supplies or materials out at our port terminals in Long Beach and Los Angeles. We jumped into action. And with a call from uh, the Harbor Department here to the great Marty Adams, who is the general manager of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, we received 700 gallons of industrial bleach within three and a half hours. Our hazmat team with construction and maintenance, uh, led by uh, Tim Clark and, and Danny Hughes, immediately began to dilute that product into 32 ounce ZEP bottles that my senior staff and I combed the South Bay over the weekend to buy from places like Home Depot. And Home Depot in Playa Vista afforded me the opportunity to buy 350 bottles that we brought back here and mixed the cleaning solution into. We all already sent them a certificate of appreciation from the city of Los Angeles and the mayor, thanking them for really stepping up as one of the great partners here with the Port of Los Angeles. Quickly, we assembled those bottles and distributed them through the great help of the Pacific Maritime Association. You'll see a picture on your screen right now. Through the great help of the Pacific Maritime Association, Chad Lindsay and so many others, Jeremy Bridges in particular was uh, such a big help to push all that product out to the marine terminals, not only in Los Angeles, but in Long Beach as well. And that led to conversations between Willie Adams, who was the international president of the ILWU based in San Francisco, and Jim McKenna, the CEO of the PMA, also based in San Francisco, to reach a coast-wide accord on safety and procedural matters for our longshore men and women across all 29 ports on the West Coast of the United States and Canada. And that is the American spirit that we needed to get through that episode. We're also working in other areas to make sure that our truck drivers have the necessary face masks and gloves. Here at the Port of Los Angeles, through Avene's leadership, we donated a thousand face masks to the Harbor Trucking Association led by Weston Labar and 500 pair of those nitro gloves. We also donated the same amounts to Teamsters Local 848 and their small group of truck drivers that they've organized over the past 20 years, but the spirit was there to give these folks the ability to pass out the protective gear to their truckers. Weston tells me that his stockpile is full right now, but he continues to rotate it out to the drivers that have needs. Secondly, to your question, John, on the FMC, I talk to Commissioner Dye on a regular basis, also Chairman Corey as well. We're working to provide any information possible, and while it's not been a popular discussion, we want to take a very professional approach to demurrage and detention. And I know some of the folks on the, uh, on the phone are waiting to hear what I say on this, but we must take a professional approach. We don't want to give excuses to have cargo sit and dwell. At the same time, we don't want to penalize folks when they cannot get their cargo. So it's a delicate balancing act. We have to find the sweet spot, but I really encourage all participants to cooperate with the FMC. So we come out the other side with very pragmatic policy that can be followed by all. And again, a strong information system will lead us on both sides of this equation to better success and more port fluidity. I call for a nationwide port community system once again. Um, from our side to Jess and John, can you describe a little bit what our nation's warehouses and DCs look like? As you know, our portfolio here in Southern California is over 1.8 billion square feet. But can you give us a general overview uh, regionally and across the nation about what they're looking like today? Yeah, this is Jess. I can jump in here and, and, um, and turn it over to John. I know uh, it's kind of a, a bit of a tale of two cities with the, the discretionary and non-discretionary retailers, um, although seeing a bit of shift there now as retailers are beginning to reopen. Um, in some cases, you do have a lot of uh, very full warehouses and a lot of looking for additional space to, um, to put the freight and, and merchandise that's coming in. And in some cases, the buildup of containers and the uh, concerns around kind of equipment imbalance and, and shipping the the containers back. Um, but in large part, um, it's either there's a high degree of congestion of a lot of the inbound um, freight and um, I think additional concern as to, you know, how that reaches back to the port and creates kind of a domino effect. Uh, John, anything to add? 
sorry, I was on mute. I, I was just going to say, obviously, you've got a lot of retailers now that are trying to figure out how they're going to proceed forwards with the reopenings. I know you've seen the news of a lot of orders that have been canceled going forwards. So, uh, you know, I think it's a lot of trying to figure it out still. Um, so I, I think it's, uh, you know, hate to say it's day by day, but I think until we can kind of get clear guidance on how stores are going to be reopening, how they can reposition um, their inventory. Uh, what the procedures are going to be in place. I think there's uh, still a lot of unknowns. I know, you know, we just put out our poor tracker and we're talking about, you know, the volumes continuing to decline over the next couple of months. So, um, you know, we want to try and get backups running as quickly as possible, but we want to do that in a uh, safe way for consumers and for our employees. Um, you know, Gene, you noted the, you know, the, the consumer and kind of where the consumer attitude is. Um, I think we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, you know, consumers do want to get back in, in shopping. Um, I don't know if they're going to go in droves to the stores. You know, they might try and, and you know, see e-commerce continue to grow as it has, uh, as retailers look to do more kind of curbside pickup, buy online, uh, pickup in store kind of activities. Um, so it's, uh, you know, folks just trying to figure it out. Um, you know, we hope to get a clearer picture soon, but, um, you know, it's really dependent on how things open. And, you know, I hate to say it, but if there's a second wave and we see something else happen, that's going to have another impact as well. Um, so it's, uh, folks are trying to figure out as best as they can at this point. The okay, thing exactly. I'd add, to, sorry, the thing I'd add to is there a lot of consumer hearing from members as well, looking at their suppliers and just from the sourcing angle, how all of this, you know, kind of the global economic picture affects the, the sourcing companies, particularly smaller and, and apparel focused, um, not just in China, but, you know, throughout, uh, a lot of the company countries where where you source from and what that kind of long-term impact will look like um, and where how sourcing patterns are going to change uh, as we continue to get further into this. There are an opportunity to look at short. Okay, good. Well, here in Southern California, we keep up with this pretty closely um, with folks who are in the business as well as those uh, in commercial real estate that observe and, and work in this space as well. And right now with the 1.8 billion square feet from the Pacific Ocean out to the Inland Empire and beyond, we've got about a 1% to 2% vacancy rate. So we're watching this very closely. And if there is any silver lining in this trade policy, it allowed us to build up some inventory, work it down a little bit until we got into this COVID-19 response area. So we're working real closely. And I'd like to thank, again, both organizations for their work with David Libatique, Fran Inman out here in Los Angeles, and, and others who really worked on the interpretation for CISA to make sure that truck drivers, warehouse folks, and those associated in logistics in and around port complexes like LA were classified as critical or in their vernacular essential. And that we will continue to work on. But watching these areas are important because as we know from experience, if any node of the supply chain gets backed up, it's gonna impact the rest of what we do. So as we continue to look for these critical goods, and I will assert to you that having early information from US Customs and that which is shared to us by cargo owners and NVOs alike, you've saved lives. By being able to point this out and get those critical medical supplies to our frontline hospitals, working with Carlos Martel of Los Angeles Customs, and being able to speed these products to market through our port and airport, we have helped the medical community. We have got small hospitals in and around Los Angeles telling us that they have begun to send out staff to the grocery store to buy hefty bags to use when treating patients because they cannot get these isolation gowns. The prices of these gowns have increased by 10 and 15% uh, times, 10 to 15 times increase in price because they are so highly sought after now by our medical community. But being able to isolate these shipments, both domestically as well as internationally, and expedite them to our hospitals, we have made an impact. And that's just simply another reason why I call for a national port community system. Yes, it's the third time I've said it on this. I need your support to get there. This is not a monetary play. It's not a competitive play, but it is for the competitiveness of our nation's supply chain. And we see now during a crisis how information sharing across the supply chain can help our mutual customers. I also want to, if there are no more questions in closing, once again, thank the Los Angeles Marine Terminal Operators. These men and women are going to work every day, just like some of us, and making sure that we keep your cargo flowing. Can't do it without you. 
the cargo owner, the BCO and the NVO both, and those in the retail community who continue to push cargo through our gateway and have confidence in what we're doing. And equally as important, I'd like to thank all of our major 11 organized labor divisions that work in and around this port complex. We are continuing with construction projects, more than $367 million worth, that are employing 3,000 construction workers every day here at the Port of Los Angeles. And while we're looking to make sure we trim our budget as tight as we can, we are a jobs multiplier and we take that responsibility very seriously. From the people who design projects at our port to those who build them and then those who work on them, all of that is very important to us. To the ILWU, locals 13, 63, and 94, the men and women are on the job every day. We wish there were more jobs. We wish more people could go out and get on the, on the work on our tarmacs every day. And we're trying with every campaign item that we have to bring more cargo here to Los Angeles. Because as our economy reemerges, the best gateway to and from Asia will be right here through Southern California. And we've got to take care of all of that other work too, as John Gold pointed out, the regulatory, the political, the taxation, and the policy. We must continue to work together. And you've got a willing partner in the Port of Los Angeles. So we'll send out the, uh, the slides to you and make sure that uh, both organizations can post them for the membership or those that couldn't attend. I'd like to especially thank our overseas callers for dialing in yet to a second video conference today. And it's uh, getting kind of late over in Europe and it's very late in Asia, but thank you so much for your support in what we're trying to do. Your guidance and advice is also always appreciated. So we'll continue if you all find these uh, updates helpful. We can tailor them, they can be short, they can be longer based on the audience that you wanna to bring together. But we are happy to over communicate with you and make sure you know as much as we do about what we're trying to do on the industrial side, our visitor serving, as well as what we're trying to do with Love LA and our response to COVID-19. So I thank you for all your support. Please stay safe and healthy and we look forward to visiting again next time. Thank you everyone.